Okay, hello everybody. My name is Jeanette Pierce and I'm gonna be your guide today on this virtual tour entitled, entitled Black History Along the Riverfront. I am the founder of the Detroit Experience Factory, which is a nonprofit we started in 2006, so 15 years ago, hard to believe it's been that long, uh, that connects locals and visitors to Detroit's people, places, and projects using immersive storytelling. We have taken over 130,000 people on experiential tours of Detroit since we were founded in 2006. And uh, now we've pivoted to take over about 5,000 people just in the last few months on these virtual tours, which you want to see, see this, honey? You want to come up? <laughs> which you'll see is a... Um, actually has a lot of upsides to it, which is actually really exciting. Uh, I didn't think that the virtual tours would be much, but they, as you'll see, we have a lot of uh, a lot of assets to a virtual tour. And this is sponsored by the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, which is responsible for the establishment, improvement, operation, maintenance, security, programming, and expansion of the Detroit Riverwalk and associated green spaces. And through its public-private partnerships, the DRFC supports the development of the Riverfront District and facilitates community access to the waterfront. And hopefully you're joining us uh, and through the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy's channels. But in case you need a little update, um, uh, we're, we do a whole tour actually, both virtual and in person when it allows of the amazing assets of the Detroit Riverfront. Uh, and, but just, if you haven't been lately, you absolutely need to go. Uh, and it's all seasons uh, that are happening. So if you haven't not seen the Valade Park, which opened um, really just a year and a half ago, uh, amazing time in the summer, but they are doing this winter at Valade programming with s'mores and ice sculptures and sledding and fun and drinks for adults and kids. Uh, so fun for all Asia, ages, um, excellent restaurants as well uh, that are there and um, so many options for fun. So don't, don't miss out on that. Uh, you also have, they also uh, maintain and uh, made possible the Dequinder Cut and Cullen Plaza and and Gabriel Richard Park, Park and uh, the um, Mount Elliott Park. And then we don't even have time to get into the plans for what's currently West Riverfront that will be the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Uh, Centennial Park, uh, but definitely check out some of that. So uh, all of these assets are brought to us by the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. And uh, we are just so, so lucky to have them uh, here in Detroit. So definitely don't miss out on that. So let's actually dive into some of the history. So we're gonna start with some um, basic Detroit history and then get into some really specific people that have uh, had a huge impact on Detroit and our legacy uh, here in the city. And we're going to go through over 150 years, uh, actually, really 300 years if we start at the beginning, right? So first of all, though this isn't the focus of our tour today, uh, it's absolutely an important part of Detroit's history. So indigenous peoples uh, in Detroit, and specifically along the river, uh, have been here for thousands of years. The uh, estimates are 10,000 years in Michigan, uh, and that would have been coming, you know, various times coming through Detroit at that point as well, uh, at, and utilizing the river, obviously, being the backbone uh, of that. Uh, and then at least a thousand years in Detroit in that there's actually a burial mound at Fort Wayne on the river uh, in southwest Detroit and uh, where they found uh, items from a thousand years ago. Uh, so it's something we don't talk about nearly enough, but um, it's really important to recognize. And so here you can see actually uh, a map uh, by an awesome resource, Detroit Urbanism, uh, that uh, the different uh, um, settlements that were here as the French, uh, when the French came, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so I, the major uh, tribes though, really quick, or, were the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, or otherwise uh, sometimes known as Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, the spellings vary. And they formed the Anishinaabe, uh, three, which means three fires. It's kind of a, a coalition. But you also had the Wyandotte, the Iroquois, the Fox, Miami, Sauk, all used Detroit's riverbanks uh, as a place to hunt and gather. And today, and this isn't just in the past, today Michigan is home to 12 federally recognized and four state recognized tribes. Uh, and we have over 100,000 Native Americans living in Michigan. And it's one of the most populous uh, states in terms of indigenous people. And uh, recently, the Detroit Indigenous Peoples Alliance which is a great organization, uh, work to get uh, Indigenous Peoples Day recognized in as uh, the second Monday in October. And also uh, as part of that, 
bring back the original name of this area, which is Wauyatanang, a word that specifically talks about the river uh, and the bend in the river. And that was the Anishinaabe uh, word for what we call Detroit today. So everything comes back to the river and the riverfront. Uh, and I think that's important to know this, this deep history. Uh, so then the Europeans arrive. Oh, I guess I should show you what this picture is on the right. So this picture on the right, right is the first Wyandotte village. And this was drawn in 1732. And where was this located? You might want to know uh, is actually, well, we can go there. So this is the part. It's a part presentation, part tour, because we're going to zoom around the map and along the water here. And uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat uh, or uh, on Facebook. And uh, we we'll, can answer them as we go out via the chat. And then at the end of the tour, we'll have time for questions uh, and you know where you can unmute or I'll be able to answer them right away. We also have Davey from Detroit Experience Factory and Renee from the Riverfront Conservancy uh, joining us uh, to uh, be in the chat box on Facebook and Zoom with you. Uh, so really quick, I mean, as we talk about the Riverfront and the Riverfront Conservancy, the eventual goal is to have five and a half miles from the Ambassador Bridge all the way to the Belle Isle Bridge. Uh, and there's you know almost four miles of that completed. The entire, uh, consists all the way from Joe Lewis to basically Mount Elliott Park. And there's this last little stretch that they're gonna be, they're actually starting to work on now that should be done next year. We're really excited about that. And then this is the West Riverfront Park that will be the Ralph Wilson, uh, Ralph C. Wilson Junior Centennial Park. But where is, was it was this Wyandotte Village? Uh, we can actually go, it's where Joe Lewis uh, and really the garage would be. So let's go see uh, what very much uh, a similar view to what the Wyandotte would have been seeing uh, without the river walk itself. Uh, but looking across the, the narrowest point of the land here uh, that was chosen uh, to between here and what is now Windsor. Also, this is just a fun uh, aspect of the virtual tours. Uh, you for those who haven't been downtown in a while, this was Joe Lewis. And you can maybe recognize those stairs there. And one of the fun things that we can do is go back in time. Uh, so you can actually see, obviously, you, many of you have been to Joe Lewis Arena before. It opened in 1979 uh, and closed just a few years ago. And now uh, there is nothing left. Uh, so this is the time travel part we get to use with using Google Maps. Uh, so this would have been that location of this first wine dot village that is pictured here. And then the Europeans arrive, right? So the French come in 1701 uh, with a guy named Cadillac. Some of you might know that might have, have been, that might sound a little familiar. Uh, yes, if we, you know, when people aren't familiar with that Cadillac was the uh, founder of Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit. Again, people were in this land for a very long time, but he did found the fort here uh, and um, you see Cadillac all over the place, Cadillac Place, Cadillac Square, book Cadillac Hotel. And you might think, wow, they really love their cars, uh, which of course we do, but the car was named after the person, not the other way around. Uh, and so this is a flag of Detroit here on the left. And some of you might be familiar with it, others not. It's uh, been making a little bit of a comeback in recent years. And it actually helps tell the story of um, the Europeans and then Americans in Detroit. Uh, so you have the French here uh, in the lower left, the fleur de lis representing the French. And then the lions here representing the British, which took over in 1760. And then the Americans in 1796. And it was actually Colonel Hamtramck who rose the American flag over the city of Detroit for the first time on July 11, 1796. And then in 1805, there was the Great Fire of Detroit. You know, uh, every big city had a great fire at some point. We started it though. Chicago totally copied off of us, right? Theirs was until 1871. Um, anyway, this is one of my favorite parts on any tour because it, it fits so many themes and especially the theme today uh, about Black history along the riverfront because the motto is Speramos Meliora Resurgit Chinaribus, which means we hope for better things, it will arise from the ashes. And I love it because we have literally and figuratively rebuilt ourselves many times in our 300 plus, thousand plus, heck 10,000 plus years of existence um, here uh, in, on this land. And it's why we fa we'll face challenges, absolutely. We'll stumble, we'll fall down, we'll make mistakes, um, but we're gonna get back up every single time. And it's by uh, and because of amazing people working together uh, to, to create something and arise from those ashes.
Uh, and we're going to talk about some of those great examples uh, today. Uh, on the right here, you see a picture of how Detroit was laid out uh, when the French, uh, throughout the French and then later the British. But these, uh, this is the four tier itself, uh, Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit. Pontchartrain, basically the French Minister of Finance, otherwise known as the guy who paid for the trip. Uh, and Détroit, meaning the straight or the narrow, because the Detroit River, funny story, not a river. It's a strait in that it connects Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. It's 32 miles long. Uh, and so this is that fort. Uh, and then the, I, the um, idea that the French had was to have these what we called what were called ribbon farms so that everybody had a little bit of access to the riverfront instead of one person just having you know, all river for a lot of riverfront land. They did these long skinny uh, pieces of land that were and that looked like ribbons, right? And so uh, this is what would have been. Obviously, it's all oriented, and the whole point is having access to the river. Um, and it, and around this time, the French have uh, only about two hundred and seventy people um, in the. Uh, like seven within like a decade or two of coming. But just to give you context, the Native Americans were at about 2000 people uh, in this area at that time. Uh, so even as late as 1765, when the British took over, there were only about 800 people, um, white people living in Detroit. And again, more than double that uh, of the native population in the surrounding areas. So, um, after that great fire. So this is actually how Detroit grew. So we always think of the map of Detroit uh, as, as how we've always known it. I mean, there might be a handful of people that have been around longer than 19 since 1926, uh, but it's a kind of cool gift that you can see uh, how we really were that small town, very small amount of people until this uh, kind of late 1800s. Uh, and then with industry and obviously the riverfront is, is front and center on all of these uh, you know, Detroit grew from the riverfront. It's important to recognize that um, with shipbuilding and stove making in the late 1800s. And then of course the automobile industry starts uh, ramping up and we need more land and we're growing in population. In fact, between 1910 and 1930, not only did we grow in space, we grew in space because we grew in population. And uh, between 1910 and 1930, our population went from 465,000 people to uh, 1.6 million. So in just 20 years, 1.2 million people. Uh, and obviously the auto industry was responsible for that. So uh, this is us again in 1806. So right around that time, 1806 is when one of our first historic heroes um, uh, really starts, like has a, makes a, a decision that will impact her life, impact the, the city's life and even our region. And that is Lisette Denison Forth. Uh, and so Lisette here uh, is pictured on the left and she was enslaved uh, here in Detroit, born into slavery in the 1780s. And so this is a, another thing that we, you know, really sad part of our history uh, as a city in that we did have slavery here. A lot of people think that that was, it only happened in the South, but in fact, it did happen in Detroit. Uh, and even after it was made illegal, uh, people continued to do it. Um, uh, and it was, it's definitely one of the, the a big stain on our, on our history. Uh, and so, and that is when she was born in the 1780s. And then in 1807, uh, she crossed the Detroit river that we, that again is the center of this conversation, uh, into Canada and, and escaped, right. And was able to establish, establish residency there and gain her freedom. And then she could have just stayed there, chilled out you know, uh, lived her life, but instead she came back to Detroit in 1815. And because, uh, and there was a rule at the time that if you establish your residency and uh, you became free that you could remain free when you came back. Uh, and so she came back from Canada and lived free uh, in 1912. And she was employed by several prominent families in Detroit. Uh, and she had a close relationship with many of her employers. Um, that and they actually helped her invest her pay in land. And so in 1825, this is absolutely amazing. In 1825, she purchased almost 50 acres of land in what is today Pontiac from the uh, 
founder or corporator of the village, Stephen Mack, as in Mack Avenue, uh, and became the first Black property owner in the city of Pontiac. And there's actually this historical marker there is at Oak Hill Cemetery in Pontiac. So it's a little away from our tour, but uh, but it's part of her story. She actually, though anchored by, um, you know, the Detroit River always played a, played a big part in her life. Uh, she actually, it's amazing because travel was not as easy as it was today, uh, actually had impact, uh, was impact, impacted different areas of our region. Um, and so uh, in 1831, so that was just the beginning that she bought 50 acres of land there. Uh, and in 1831, she began to be employed by Detroit Mayor John Biddle uh, and actually lived uh, where he lived at the time. Um, he originally was in Detroit and then bought a lot of land in uh, and named it Wyandotte. So he, uh, after the Native American tribe, uh, and she spent the next 30 years working for that family. She had bought her own house and livestock in Detroit. Uh, she bought stock in a steamboat and a bank. Uh, and she attended Old Mariner's Church, which is right here on the Detroit Riverfront. So uh, just a hop, skip, and a jump from Joe Louis Arena. Let's go check it out. Uh, the Mariner's, you've probably seen it before. It's right here at Jefferson, uh, on Jefferson, which obviously follows the river. And the Mariner's Church is the oldest church building in the city of Detroit. It's uh, been here since 1849. And you might think, well, I've heard about St. Anne's. What about St. Anne's? I thought that was really old. And St. Anne's is old. It is the oldest parish. It was founded in 1701 uh, when it right shortly after Cadillac arrived here. Uh, but it's actually on, I think it's third building. So it's, you know, that's, it's only from like 1850s or something. <laughs> so it's close to actually being the oldest building as well. But um, uh, but actually, this is our second oldest building, 1849, and down the street is our oldest, which is 1848. But what was special about the Mariner's Church is that it was actually two women that came together to um, raise money for it to be built so that sailors or mariners uh, could have a place to go to church uh, and that people from different walks of life and people who didn't uh, couldn't afford to uh, pay a lot of money because at that time you really had to give a lot of money for church uh, to have a pew and in the church it even had uh, retail built into it so they could collect rent to help pay for the church uh, and fun fact kind of aside but uh, this uh, bell tower here which was added when it was moved actually it was moved to make um, 800 feet to make room for Hart Plaza is the bell that chimed 29 times for the men on the Edmund Fitzgerald from that uh, classic uh, Gordon Lightfoot song, but I digress. But it's important to know that she was uh, a member of this church because it's what inspired her to actually, uh, in her will, leave money to uh, build a church of uh, for people on Gross Eel because she had done work again down river. Uh, and so, uh, or working with the Biddles down river. And so this little uh, picture of the of the church is what she left uh, money to found St. James Episcopal Church with the sole purpose of rich and poor worshiping together. Uh, and that church still exists today uh, at, on Gross Eel. And so all of this as a, a, f a former enslaved person, a woman uh, in the late, eight, se late 1700s, early 1800s uh, is just absolutely amazing. And we should all uh, know the name. Lisette was her nickname, Elizabeth, but uh, Lisette Dennison Forth. So uh, just one of the many heroes who utilized and uh, was part of the Detroit River's history. Another one is William Lambert. Uh, and William Lambert uh, was um, a local gar in the local garment industry. He owned his own successful tailoring and dry cleaning businesses. Um, and it, they said, but by the time of his death in 1890, his uh, successes in business would leave behind a state, uh, an estate of uh, what would today be millions and millions of dollars, like almost $20 million, which is amazing. Uh, but it's not just his success in business that makes him a hero. Absolutely not. Uh, he had such an impact on Detroit uh, then and today. So he was a first uh, a member of the Second Baptist Church, which many of you have seen and is a little bit off the river. Uh, but just to show you where it's at, uh, many of you I guarantee you, if you've been to Detroit, you have been by, um, oh, we're going to go to this one, you have been by the Second Baptist Church, uh, which is just a few blocks off the riverfront on Monroe Street 
in Greektown. Some of you on the call today, maybe you're members or have been to church there. Um, but yeah, right, everyone's been to Greektown, right? Which, by the way, originally settled by the Germans um, and became, uh, it was Greek later. But this church right here on the corner, Second Baptist Church, it's the oldest Black congregation in the state of Michigan. It was founded in 1836 uh, by uh, 13 uh, free Black people. Uh, some of them had uh, been enslaved earlier in their life, and they founded this church in 1836. Uh, the building uh, is the, the one on the left is from 1914 and this newer one from 1968, but it was a major stop on the Underground Railroad and you can still go and actually, uh, or once COVID's over at least, uh, make, an make an appointment and go and actually see and learn about uh, Second Baptist role. Um, but William Lambert uh, and ever actually well, Reverend William C. Monroe, who was the pastor there, uh, actually broke away to form a second church, St. Matthew, Matthew's Methodist Church, which was founded by William Lambert, Lambert in 1846, originally above a blacksmith shop. Uh, and then they actually built this church. You can see the picture of it. The original one is lo was located at the of St. Antoine and Congress Streets. Uh, so this uh, St. Antoine and Congress, if we go look at that, uh, is right by the Quinder Cut, which is, uh, you know, part of this tour as well, because, hey, Riverfront, it's close to the Riverfront. It's all about connections to the Riverfront, right? Which is not just because of this tour, but again, everything connects to the Riverfront. All of Detroit's history, I, you saw the growth of the city. Uh, and, um, and so St. Aubin and Congress has us uh, right... Uh, basically here, you know, in the um, between Lafayette and Larned, because Congress doesn't nowadays come all the way through. But uh, so right here near uh, St. Aubin and would be kind of Larned today. Uh, and so they, uh, through this church, he also founds the uh, organization that that is the hub of the Underground Railroad in Detroit. And so over the next uh, decade, nearly 40,000 uh, freedom seekers would pass through Detroit under the support and guidance of Lambert um, and uh, George de Baptiste, who we'll talk about next, uh, and through St. Matthew's and other churches in the city. Um, and St. Matthew's still exists today. Uh, in the 70s, they, uh, they, their second, their location, they moved actually to where today, what, what is today Ford Field. Um, and then that church was torn down uh, and they actually found a time capsule when they did that. And there's amazing, um, amazing pieces of history in that time capsule that are now on display at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. Uh, but they joined forces with, um, with St. Joe's. And so it's St. Matt's and, uh, and St. Joe's on Woodward Avenue, still an active part of our community and uh, a leader in social justice in the city. And all of that was started in 1846. It's one of the oldest uh, Black Episcopal Church in the entire country and started by William Lambert here uh, in 1846 above a blacksmith shop. So uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, and, what, and his good friend and colleague uh, was George de, ba de Baptiste. Uh, and uh, this is a photo of George uh, here. And then also we're gonna talk uh, next about this statue that you might recognize in this picture, but George de Baptiste is actually, uh, you can see the resemblance as the conductor of the Underground Railroad in this Gateway to Freedom Monument that we'll talk about shortly. Uh, so George de Baptiste has a, an amazing life story as well. Uh, he arrived in, uh, in Detroit in 1846, but before that, uh, he actually was the valet for Will President William Henry Harrison, who was the shortest uh, lived president uh, in just about a month. Uh, you might've heard the story he caught cold on inauguration day or, or so the thought is, but it's likely again, it wasn't just from that. Um, and he died a month after uh, being uh, becoming president, but George de Baptiste was at his side and was his valet. And, uh, but then when he died, he left Washington DC uh, and then came back to the Midwest and then eventually to Detroit in 1846. Uh, and he was both, uh, he was a barber by trade, but then he eventually also uh, opened a bakery. I mean, entrepreneurship uh, is not new uh, in Detroit at all. It is, uh, we've had a lot of 
conversations about it lately and a lot of attention to it, but it is uh, absolutely part of Detroit's history, entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, and uh, inspiration, being inspired by other people. But he also eventually bought a steamship, uh, which he called the T. Whitney. And though black men were not allowed to captain ships, he hired a white man to pilot the boat and they ferried cargo, including what was listed as black wool, but were actual freedom, actually freedom seekers. Uh, so across the Detroit River to Canada. So uh, he was instrumental along with William Lambert of forming the Colored Vigilant Committee, uh, which again was the main organization for Underground Railroad uh, in Detroit. He also founded the Order of the Men of Oppression or uh, and two secret societies uh, that helped run the Underground Railroad. And then uh, him and William Lambert were both at the meeting at William Webb's house, who's another amazing abolitionist and uh, conductor on the Underground Railroad. But William Webb hosted a meeting on March 12th, 1859, uh, where Frederick Douglass, uh, who had come to Detroit, and John Brown met to discuss uh, how to, uh, you know, get rid of slavery, how to be helpful and and what what we could do. All of these uh, men who had been working so hard uh, had this meeting. I mean, it's, it'd be amazing to be there. And it was shortly before John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, and so there's some thought that it was discussed there, uh, but that um, that it didn't get a lot of support from the other men there. And then once the Civil War began, uh, De Baptist helped recruit a regiment of black soldiers, uh, eventually known as the 102nd U.S. Colored Troops, and became responsible uh, for that uh, for that division. And he was uh, after coming back from the Civil War. I mean, we're just like he just keeps going. It's just the you know the amount of impact that George De Baptiste had uh, is really. Uh, just staggering. Uh, so he came back, he returned to Detroit after fighting a war, after being years in the Underground Railroad, uh, and he opens an ice cream parlor and catering business, uh, which I just love, and who doesn't love ice cream? Uh, and he, But he kept uh, continuing his life's work of helping fellow African-Americans, uh, really being and being an agent for the Freedmen's Age Commitment uh, Commission. And so uh, he died in, in 1875, and there's actually a historical marker at his home. So let's actually, um, what we're gonna do also is provide a link uh, for folks of this map, which has um, all of these places that I'm taking you to and talking about, uh, so that if you want to go and see them in person, you'll be able to do so. Uh, and so if where it was George de Baptiste's home, not far from places that you probably have been, whether that's Sweetwater or again, just or St. Andrews or down the street from Greektown. Uh, but here is the George the Baptiste home site. And there is a historical marker uh, there today. So we can go to, sorry, the maps uh, are all good. What do I want from you? Oh, uh, we'll go to it right here then instead. Uh, so we'll just zoom back down Larned and go right here and put our little guy on the corner of Bobian and Larned, right here. And you might have walked by it, but have you ever stopped to read it? So the, we have amazing historical markers and there's actually a great website, Michigan Historical Markers, that lists every single one. Um, my husband and I are history nerds uh, and I'm a lifelong Detroiter. I've never not lived in the city, but I part of the reason I started this organization was because there's so much we don't know, even if we know a lot, uh, there's always more to learn, right? And one of the things my husband and I would do is we would just go in search of historical markers around the city and then around the region and even throughout the state. We jokingly say we want a bumper sticker that says we break for historical markers because we do. Uh, so here is the uh, George de Baptiste home site historical marker uh, right here at the corner of Larned and Bobian. And then just um, around the corner from that um, near the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, spaces on Congress here are uh, as another historic marker. And this was the location of William Webb's home. And you can see here, the Frederick Douglass John Brown meeting has a historic marker. Um, not totally part of this tour, but it's obviously right here is the first Jewish religious services were actually uh, just uh, in this vicinity as well. Uh, and that was where what is today the Temple Bethel was started. Um, you can see here in 1850 uh, in the uh, in 
um, a, a couple's home in right here. Uh, and so there actually was a, this was a period where you had uh, Jewish and black people living together and, uh, and very near each other. Uh, and also um, uh, there's not a historical marker then maybe that's something that should maybe happen, but William Lambert's uh, lived not far from here and actually had his tailor shop uh, was right around the corner uh, here near um, basically, well, first on Larned and then actually over here at, uh, on East Jefferson where City Hall is today. Um, so speaking about the Underground Railroad, so we talked about a few people that were involved with it, um, both as someone who was uh, escaping and search, uh, searching for freedom with Lisette Dennison, uh, as well as William Lambert and George the Baptiste. Uh, but many of uh, all of the Detroit's role in the Underground Railroad is, uh, is all, oh, I'm totally blanking on a word, sorry about that, but Detroit's role in the Underground Railroad uh, is um, told in the story of this monument by Ed Dwight uh, called the Gateway to Freedom Monument, uh, which is on the Detroit River. Uh, so we can go and see that actually today. It is right near Hart Plaza uh, on the Detroit Riverwalk. How fun is this? We can literally, again, just go there um, and you can see, um, Read this, until emancipation, Detroit and the Detroit River community served as the gateway to freedom for thousands of African-American people escaping enslavement. Detroit was one of the largest terminals of the Underground Railroad, a network of abolitionists aiding enslaved people seeking freedom. Uh, our code name was Midnight. At first, Michigan was a destination for freedom seekers, but Canada became a safer sanctuary after slavery was abolished there in 1834. Again, 30 years before uh, it was abolished in in America. And with passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, um, many runaways left their homes in Detroit and crossed the river to Canada to remain free. Some returned, but many didn't. Uh, and the successful operation of Detroit's Underground Rail Railroad was due to the effort and cooperation of diverse groups of people, including African, uh, those of African descent, whites, and North American Indians. And this legacy of freedom is a vital part of Detroit and its history, uh, especially again, along the Detroit River. So here are some pictures of the monument itself. Uh, and it, you know, there's the statue, uh, which is obviously the main piece of it, but there's also these two um, uh, flame, flame holders on the side, the map of uh, where some of the underground railroad spots were. And then again, this map here of the different routes uh, to Michigan. Uh, and Detroit, and then ultimately for many to Canada, because the Fugitive Slave Act uh, made it really difficult. So at first it was about being able to get here to Detroit where, uh, where slavery was outlawed at that time. Uh, but the Fugitive Slave Act allowed for um, bounty hunters to basically come anywhere, even if it's been, was made illegal uh, and take people back. And sometimes they would kidnap uh, free uh, black people and take them back. I mean, it's, it was just tragic. So uh, not like we, I mean, hopefully everyone understands uh, uh, the role and we actually uh, have an entire tour uh, about the history of racism and policies uh, in Detroit and the country um, that we have uh, open to the public every month. But the, there's no, it really debunks the whole state myth, states rights myth, right? So if anyone says, oh, you know, the Civil War was about states rights, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 just debunks that because that meant someone from some other state could come to Michigan and, uh, and, and kidnap somebody. And that really flies in the face of the whole state rights argument, uh, which is debunked from the beginning. Anyway, uh, we could go into more of that, but we have uh, more people to talk about today. Uh, so um, it is uh, this statue uh, has a sister statue as well uh, across the river. Uh, and this was actually placed, it was dedicated in 2001 as, uh, and it was a project of the Detroit 300 Conservancy, which was created to celebrate Detroit's 300th birthday in 2001 and the International Underground Railroad Monument Collaborative. Uh, and so on the other side, and this is what's great about the virtual tour as well, is on the other side, it, uh, which we normally be pretty tough to, to go take you to Canada, especially right now. Uh, but what we can do right now is actually pop on over to Windsor uh, and actually see where the tower of, actually just put it in, tower of freedom is what it's called over here. 
Uh, and it's just, you know, if you come through the tunnel or next time you get a chance to go over to Windsor, we also actually have um, an amazing tour guide in Windsor and do virtual tours of Windsor. It really allows us, us to do a lot of really cool stuff. So this is where you'll see Ed Dwight's sister sculpture here, um, where they, uh, it looks like this. Uh, so very different, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, so this is that family that you see here uh, that George Baptiste is, you know, giving directions to. Uh, and then you see them arriving in Canada uh, and being greeted by somebody who uh, maybe was there before them, uh, maybe a reunited family. Uh, and so keeping the flame of freedom alive is, uh, this is what this monument is all about. So absolutely amazing. Um, so moving along in history, uh, another amazing hero is Fanny Richards. Uh, and we'll go see her historical marker in a second, but let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Fanny Richards was Detroit's first black school teacher and she was born to free parents in, uh, in 1840 in Virginia, uh, but then uh, had a chance to uh, go to Toronto and go to school. And she even studied in Germany where she was influenced by Wilhelm Forable who was developing the concept of kindergarten, uh, which we all, you know, we just take for granted that it's always been around kindergarten, uh, but this was a really new concept uh, at that time. And, uh, and so after permanently settling in Detroit, be, she was allowed to teach in Detroit because of her brilliant scholastic record. Uh, and that's why she was the first black school teacher. And actually she had started her own uh, kind of private school for, uh, for black students in 1863. Uh, and then in 1868, she was appointed instructor at Colored School Number Two. So we also had segregation in Detroit, where again, too often it's taught uh, or it seems to be uh, the story goes that, oh, the South did this, but the North, we were so much better. When not the case. We did also have segregation here. Uh, and actually, Fannie Richards is one of a number of Detroit leaders who opposed the idea of segregated public schools. So after, in 1869, after a, an intense campaign, the Michigan Supreme Court ordered the Detroit Board of Education to abolish separate schools for Black and white students. And Richards was transferred to the newly integrated Ele Everett Elementary School, where she taught for 44 years. Uh, and it was there that she established the first kindergarten in Michigan. Uh, and then in 1915, she, after more than 50 years of service, she finally retired from teaching. But her achievements were not just limited to education. She helped to found, finance, and became president of the Phyllis Wheatley Home, uh, who's named for the poet. Uh, but it was the home for age colored ladies, an institution organized in uh, 1898 to help poor and elderly black women. She was also one of the founders of the Michigan State Association of Colored Women uh, and taught Sunday school at the historic Second Baptist Church for over 50 years. Uh, all of this, uh, I mean, again, just get tired just thinking about it, uh, but because of this, she was inducted to the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame in 1990. And um, she was uh, the chief catalyst for the desegregation of Detroit schools. Uh, and um, and again, bringing kindergarten and, and that whole idea that we is thrown around all the time now of early childhood education uh, was uh, she was the one that brought that to Michigan, and she lived um, in an area uh, known as uh, Black Bottom that we're going to talk about next. But we're also going to go see um, her. Um, let's do this. We're going to go see her where that was and that was right here um, off the Detroit River. So what's great about this is you can like see some of these places along the riverfront. You can get on the Dequinder Cut, pop off the Dequinder Cut uh, and go and see uh, some of these places. So this is where it's at. Uh, and we'll go back into this map uh, and come back to America, you know, just a jaunt over to Canada. Uh, I can't wait till they open the border again. Uh, but it's on Rivar here just by Lafayette. And if you don't know, if, or if you haven't been on the Quinter Cut, there is an entrance uh, and exit uh, here at Lafayette and, and the Dequinder Cut. So you just pop off of there and you can come right over here to see uh, in, in the Lafayette Park neighborhood. Just pop over here, where to go? Um, to see the Fanny Richards 
uh, home site. So this is where her house was. That's where, this is where she came home for every day of those 50 years that she was teaching uh, to this site on Rivard near Lafayette. Uh, and we are so thankful for all the work uh, that she did. Uh, and uh, we wish she had her around today, but we have lots of great people today. We'll do a whole nother tour on, uh, you know, we call it, uh, you know, innovation and inspiration on today in Detroit. We actually have one of those coming up as well. Um, so that this area that we're talking about here, uh, what is today Lafayette Park uh, around here was originally um, a, the Black Bottom neighborhood. And that name actually um, comes from when the French were here, there was um, a, you know, a series of small, and there is still, many of them are just buried, small creeks and, and rivers, you know, offshoots of the Detroit River. So, um, you know, Connor Creek is one of those ones, that, like on the east side, uh, you had uh, the Savoyard River kind of ran that actually runs, you know, below uh, downtown throughout Elmwood Cemetery here. You can see uh, this, uh, this creek, which actually became uh, known is called Bloody Run Creek because of the Battle of Bloody Run. Uh, but because of all these different little uh, waterways um, that were, um, you know, that came off of or that fed into the Detroit River, I should say, there was a lot of sediment and there was a lot of black and arable land, right? So the French actually started calling this area Black Bottom back when they had those ribbon farms that we saw earlier, right? And so, um, but then later it became the name of the, I mean, it became the neighborhood where uh, African-Americans, one of the few places actually African-Americans were allowed to live in Detroit, again, because of segregation. Uh, and so many of Detroit's um, uh, names that you know today started in Black Bottom uh, and Paradise Valley. So just to give you a little context, because you might have heard about it, but where exactly was it? Uh, so this is a general idea of a map of uh, the former Black Bottom neighborhood. Uh, so it would have been Gratiot on the north here for the most part. Um, and so Eastern Market was adjacent to, uh, to Black Bottom, but it wasn't part of it. Uh, and then um, as far west as Brush uh, and then Jefferson, so right along almost to the river. South of Jefferson was all, was all industrial for for decades really until, even until the, the Riverfront Conservancy started working on some of that land um, back in 2003. But, and then St. Aubin on the east, but it, but not, the boundaries were never completely, um, you know, it wasn't uh, completely solid. It was a little amorphous. Um, and so, and then you might also be familiar, you heard of Paradise Valley. So if you think of Paradise Valley, the neighborhood actually went even more, um, a lot up a little bit, you know, more north. So Paradise Valley was kind of the, think of it as the entertainment district, the business district, um, where Black Bottom was uh, more residential. And there were residential in Paradise Valley and some commercial in uh, Black Bottom, but for in general, Paradise Valley was the commercial and Black Bottom was the residential. And Paradise Valley was kind of long and skinny, um, anchored by Hastings Street, uh, which is which I-75, I-375 here go completely on top of. But for example, the Paradise Valley Theater uh, was uh, Orchestra Hall, which uh, was Orchestra Hall, then it was Paradise Valley Theater, then it was empty for a long time. So uh, that is obviously, you know, as far west as Woodward here uh, at that time in the, in the 1930s and such. But again, basically this whole Lower East Side uh, was the Black Bottom and Paradise Valley District. Uh, and there's an amazing, um, resource. Recently, the Detroit, uh, well, actually, um, a young woman found uh, 800 uh, photos of Black Bottom when she was looking uh, through the Burton Historical Collection and, uh, and worked on a project called the Black Bottom Collective, working with people that remembered uh, Black Bottom, that had their own memories, their own photos. Uh, and they, and then the Detroit Free Press, uh, and we'll share a link to this as well. The F Detroit Free Press did this awesome kind of, um, you know, this is what it was, and this is exactly what it looked like. You know, this is uh, then and now, basically. And so you can see the Lafayette Park meets Vandero townhomes and what it looked like, and even uh, what, you know, where the Greektown parking structure is, Monroe uh, would have been Black Bottom as well. And the destruction of Black Bottom, um, 
started, but was actually started by, well, Jeffries, uh, Mayor Jeffries kind of began the plan and it, uh, this great plan as they saw it to uh, modernize and, and have slum removal. Uh, and then uh, Mayor Cobo really implemented it. And, uh, and he was supported by, um, and he ran on Jim Crow and segregationist policies, was supported by the KKK. Uh, and so that's why his, the, his name is no longer associated with our convention center. Um, but uh, so many people got their start or had connections to Black Bottom. We could do a whole tour on this. And I should mention also that Jamon Jordan of Black Scroll Networks and Tours, uh, Network and Tours is an amazing resource uh, and is doing does programs all the time. If you wanna learn more about a lot of the things that we're talking about, uh, he is definitely an expert, especially on um, you know, the, the far back history, really, you know, everything Black Bottom. I just, uh, he just did on the, in the uh, civil rights uh, department for the city on their Facebook. There's actually some great uh, additional content if you wanna check that out. Um, but one of the most famous names to be connected to Black Bottom is none other than Aretha Franklin. And in 1956, a 14 year old Aretha Franklin made her first recording uh, at JVB Records um, uh, by J with JVB, J JVB Records at the New Bethel Church that her father was pastor at. Uh, and, uh, and that was located at 4210 Hastings Street. So this picture is of uh, Joe's records. And um, and you can see here, Joe's records, recordings by Reverend Franklin. Uh, and this is where her da his daughter recorded her first record too. Uh, and where is that located? Uh, so this is where we see the destruction of Paradise Valley, uh, but it is still, um, if you wanna just know where from a context standpoint, I'm gonna zoom in. Uh, and it is actually right off of, it would be just, they would have been right here. So Hastings Street is the, is the main street for Paradise Valley. And again, it wasn't, the freeway didn't dissect it or bisect it, it went right over it. Uh, so both the location of the New Bethel uh, Church, as well as Joe's uh, record shop would have been right here. So there's, um, if you didn't know that a Quinder cut goes all the way all the way up to Mac. So from the riverfront, all the way to Mac there. So the extension was uh, opened a few years ago. And um, I've, I did, I've done a lot this fall uh, and uh, in this winter even, and it's really beautiful. Anyway, so you could pop off over here at Mac and you could take a MOGO, you could take walking, biking, uh, even those little scooters if you wanted. And then you, uh, if you wanna, or you can drive by on Mac here, but not on the Quinter Cut, no driving on the Quinter Cut. Uh, but so uh, basically that Joe's records would have been uh, about right here. Uh, and then just a couple blocks away would have been the New Bethel Baptist Church original location. Uh, and now it is actually located in on the near west side of Detroit. Um, but, you know, Aretha Franklin, you know, is not just uh, an amazing, it was not just an amazing uh, singer and pop artist. Uh, I mean, she was also a civil rights activist uh, and, um, and, and really involved with her father uh, and the New Bethel Baptist Church where she started singing gospel. And, I mean, and she also wasn't just, I mean, a singer again, for the youngins, if you don't know, man, Aretha, I mean, literally dubbed the queen of soul and is one of the best-selling artists of all time with 75 million records sold worldwide. And where was her first record recorded? Just uh, a few blocks off the riverfront and the Quinter Cut uh, right here. First record out of 75 million. Uh, that's a, a pretty big deal. Um, but as I mentioned, she wasn't just, uh, well, we'll come back. So then this is the picture of the uh, before of Paradise Valley and the after the freeway. So between the uh, quote unquote slum removal uh, that was uh, one of the most um, tragic uh, mistakes, racist policy decisions in Detroit's history, uh, we, we lost hundreds of businesses. Uh, and, and so uh, estimates are about 350 black businesses and over a thousand homes. Uh, were destroyed and um, and almost all black residents and black business owners displaced uh, with nothing, very little to nothing uh, given in return. And so this is also really important. And we talk about this in a bigger picture on a lot of our, uh, again, more um, 
in-depth tours, but that it's important to know this history, especially, you know, to know and understand what's happening today. There, uh, you know, the distrust of government, this is only in, I mean, the last uh, part of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley was, um, was knocked down in 1964. So, we're really not talking that long ago. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of people that live through this uh, and you can understand the distrust. And it's important to, to, to recognize that that is there, uh, that that distrust isn't paranoia. It's actually, there's a reason for it and that there, it needs a little effort to, uh, to recognize that that, that, needs, that that trust needs to be rebuilt. Right. Um, and so 1964, this is, um, you know, destroyed. Uh, I mean, most of it's, in the early, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, but uh, Aretha Franklin uh, has, has now has a new place on the Detroit Riverfront. Uh, and so that is Aretha Franklin Amphitheater. So let's go check that out. Uh, you might know it as Shane Park. So um, actually, we'll just click on this. So Shane Park uh, is, and if you haven't been, you need to put it on your list, especially now with the rename of Aretha. Uh, and I mean, it is just the absolute most amazing venue here uh, to listen to an amazing music or bring your boat uh, and, uh, and have the, the breeze from the river blowing in uh, an amazing, amazing space here. And it's located right between uh, Valade Park and Millican, uh, and Millican State Park and just a hop, skip and a jump from the uh, Cullen Plaza and the Dequinder Cut. Uh, just since we're right here, check this out. I love that people have posted photos. So this is the winter at Valade. Uh, they got the fire, you got, you know, beaches in the summer, but the beach is still there. It just happens to be cold outside. Uh, but uh, amazing, amazing uh, setup for the winter as well. And again, uh, just a newer, a newer park here along the riverfront. Um, one of the things I have to say I love about the Detroit Riverfront, and I say this not just on Riverfront Tours, uh, but it's also an example of, you know, it goes with this theme and kind of our, our city's theme of, of always rebuilding, and uh, is that they didn't wait till they had all five and a half miles of land and all, uh, all the possible money that, you know, they could raise to develop a 5.5 miles of land. They got some land, you know, with GM and the city and some money with Kresge, uh, I mean, a good chunk of money with Kresge, uh, and they started somewhere, not everywhere. And that's what our friends at Build Institute say, and I love it. Uh, and then added Cullen Plaza and then Mount Elliott. And then, uh, you know, just keep on building, keep on building that momentum and every little bit really matters. Uh, and uh, and I think we're seeing that with these different stories that we're telling and, and the different impact uh, that um, starting somewhere, not everywhere is a great example of that. Um, but, uh, but one other spot that kind of connects to so Aretha, as we mentioned, not just a singer, but uh, a civil rights activist uh, and a space that uh, is important in, in history along the riverfront as well. Uh, again, now it's called TCF Center, rightfully so, soon to be renamed Huntington Center, as um, that is uh, Huntington and TCF just joined forces. Uh, so, but we all know where uh, the convention center is right here. And Kobo Arena, um, which is, you know, they just underwent a, the hall, uh, the whole convention center just underwent a $300 million expansion and renovation about five years ago. Um, but the arena was actually a venue for uh, all sorts of events. And actually the Detroit Pistons played here. I, I should pull up a slide of Dave Bing playing at Cobo Hall uh, because he did, but it was, all, it was actually uh, CL Franklin, um, the uh, Aretha's father, who was instrumental in bringing Martin Luther King here for the great March to freedom. And so you can, this picture is taken at Cobo Hall. Uh, and on June 23rd, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. led some say up to 200,000 people down Woodward to the riverfront to Cobo Hall, where he gave the I Have a Dream speech for uh, pretty much one of the first times ever. And this was two months before August of 63 with the March on Washington. And he did it in Detroit first, not just the speech, but the whole event was almost like a test run for, uh, for Washington, but also uh, so much, there was so much, uh, important work that needed to happen in Detroit. Uh, and so, and you can, he was recorded on Motown Records. So this is actually the cover, album cover. And you, if you want to ever hear the uncut version of the Mar uh, the I Have a Dream speech, it is available online. And um, 
And Barry Gordy always liked to call uh, Martin Luther King a Motown recording artist, which I guess is technically true. Um, but then uh, just a few years later, and so that was, uh, you know, Aretha and her father and, uh, and a whole group of people that that made that happen. Um, but then this picture on the right, also at Cobo Hall, is in, from 1967, where Martin Luther King presented Aretha with the Southern Christian Leadership Award at Cobo, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then uh, this next photo real quick is we're gonna, gonna wrap up soon and we could do this forever. So first of all too, uh, it's always so hard to pick you know, who to talk about when there's just hundreds of, of people, of organizations, of places that have had an impact on Detroit. Um, and, uh, but uh, here, these are just a few that, and all with a focus uh, along the, showing the importance of, of the riverfront and allowing you to be able to come down, visit the riverfront, and then also visit some of these spaces and places uh, and have just a different perspective next time you're taking a walk along the river uh, because there's so much history tied to it. Uh, and so here, of course, is Coleman Young. Uh, who was born in Tuscaloosa in 1918, but he moved to Detroit's Black Bottom when he was five years old and he was, and he grew up there and he went to Miller Intermediate School, which uh, Miller School is still there. Um, actually, we'll do a quick peek uh, of that as well. And this uh, school has its, um, has its uh, a lot of history too. Um, so talk about right by the DeQuinder Cut. So it is right here. Uh, so again, DeQuinder Cut, you can just get off at Gratiot, you know, so there's a Gratiot entrance to the DeQuinder Cut. And then you pop over to St. Antoine and actually uh, Mosaic Youth Theater, which is an amazing organization there, um, headquartered here in the Miller uh, Middle School. Uh, and again, we could do a whole tour almost just on, on uh, Miller, on the Miller School. But anyway, uh, so he grew up over there, went to Miller. And then he actually served in World War II Air Force as a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, and when he came back, he uh, you know, had a lot of trouble in the 50s because he was fighting for workers' rights. He was accused of communism, but he was then elected state senator in 1964. And of course, ran for mayor with a focus on abolishing stress, which was uh, an acronym by the Detroit police called that stood for Stop the Robberies, Enjoy Safe Streets. And it was an undercover unit that had killed um, almost a dozen young black men and boys and um, and the community was pushing for it to stop. And that's what he ran, one of the platforms that he ran on. And of course he won in 1973, he was elected uh, Detroit's first black mayor in 1974, served five terms. Uh, and of course, and, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of misinformation out there about Coleman Young, but he was um, a people's hero in Detroit uh, and, uh, and a black hero in so many different ways from the Tuskegee Airmen uh, to, his, you know, abolishing stress uh, and, um, and it really, uh, there's some really great articles. If you if you want to know more about Coleman Young, I, I suggest you look it up. And of course, you know, there's uh, nobody's perfect, but he certainly did a lot of amazing good for Detroit and gets, uh, unfortunately, sometimes a bad reputation, but that uh, he doesn't quite deserve. So, and this, and I love this picture, which is from the top of Kobo. Um, so, uh, or actually Joe Lewis uh, looking over a Kobo there. Cause he, one of the things he did was actually almost solely responsible for keeping the Detroit Red Wings in Detroit in 1979. That's a fun little story. Um, well, I'm gonna wrap it up there. There's one other thing I would just really quick wanna just mention uh, as we get up into more modern here, you know, it doesn't, heroes are not just in history. Um, you know, Juan Atkins, Kevin Saunderson and Derek May, I mean, it's a different kind of hero. I mean, but uh, these, um, these gentlemen are the undisputed architects of techno. And if you didn't know Detroit, they founded techno, Detroit here. Uh, and they were influenced by disco and it's infant offspring house music, but these guys reinterpreted prototypical electronic music to reflect the unyielding urban landscape scan, eh, landscape of their hometown Detroit. And of course, Heart Plaza uh, and is where the Movement Festival here, which is celebrating 20 years and the Detroit Historical Museum has an amazing exhibit on uh, 20 years of the techno festival uh, and also on exhibits on a lot of the different people we've talked about today. They also have an amazing online resource, the Detroit Historical Museum. You can find out tons of information about them uh, or about so much of Detroit history. Uh, and their Detroit 67 exhibit won the gold medal for uh, awards uh, for exhibits across the country and second worldwide. And they just announced that it's going to be a permanent exhibit um, to honor uh, our friend, 
Marlo Stoudemire, who uh, passed away last year, uh, last March of COVID. Um, so uh, definitely use it as a resource, but of course we all know where Heart Plaza is, right? I don't need to, I don't need to tell you, but, uh, but it definitely is a spot. It's not just a beautiful space. It has um, ha held all sorts of uh, amazing events and continues to do so. And it's named for Senator Philip Hart, by the way, uh, if you ever wonder uh, who was um, known as like the people center. And then the very last thing, just a personal hero of mine and really bringing it to today uh, is Oyami Dabbles. Um, this, uh, he is a, um, uh, was born in 1948 and is and moved to Detroit in the 60s and his work is just absolutely amazing. He started the African Bead Museum, which you can see here, but this picture on your right, this is my favorite of the murals in the market uh, festival. So if you're not familiar with murals in the market, uh, the murals in the market festival has painted um, every year they paint about 30 to 50 murals and now it's uh, had five years so over almost 150 murals uh, that flank eastern market um, all the whole neighborhood including the dequinder cut so uh, let's actually go take a look at my favorite mural by Olayami Davos, uh, which is right here there's mac sorry uh, and there is, here we go. Here's Wilkins right here. Okay. So right on this bridge that crosses, whoop, whoop. here's the Dequinder cut, we'll come back to see. So this is a great mural too. But so this is the Dequinder cut and it passed, you can see it a smidge this way. Hello Dequinder cut, how are you? Hello to Quindercut and see that's Mac up there and you have the uh, Keep Growing Detroit Garden here. And then um, my favorite piece again, Bioliami Dabbles here, uh, this amazing, beautiful space, um, uh, beautiful piece. And also another fun time to go back and see what it looked like uh, before, uh, both before the Quinder cut uh, when uh, all of this was uh, abandoned uh, Grand Trunk Railroad, and then uh, this mural was painted, or it was created in 2016. And he likes to use mirrors because it brings the, uh, the, um, the viewer into the art, uh, which I think is really amazing. Uh, so anyway, I could go on forever and a day, but I'm gonna end there and open it up to questions and comments. But I wanna always end with this, um, that Detroit is big enough to matter in the world and small enough for you to matter in it. And you can see, uh, we touched on just a few people today throughout Detroit's history, Detroit's black history. But if you were paying attention, you, I'm sure you realize that Detroit's history is black history. Uh, and uh, and we uh, are so lucky to have had people, uh, amazing uh, heroes and leaders, and that we continue to do so today. And that each one of them and each one of you uh, has uh, an opportunity to have a positive impact, not just on our city, but by doing so impact the world. So on that note, uh, please uh, support the Detroit Riverfront. You can go to DetroitRiverfront.org for information, event schedules, or to donate. Uh, also check us out at DetroitExperienceFactory.org. We're also a 501c3. You can donate, book a tour, check out our resources page. Uh, we have lots of information. Uh, we book private and uh, virtual and uh, when the weather gets better, social distant masked up in person, uh, but follow us on social, all of those things, but support organizations, support uh, Detroit histories, share some of this information with people. Again, we'll be putting this, uh, it'll be up on Facebook on the River Detroit Riverfront Conservancy page, and it will be on uh, the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy YouTube um, tomorrow or this weekend, and uh, you can share it with other people. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed uh, your time, and I hope that you learned something, and I hope you saw how cool virtual tours can be, especially when you're dealing with a city with as amazing uh, people, places, and projects as Detroit. So on that note, I'm going to uh, stop talking and uh, turn it over for questions um, coming in through either the chat uh, or Facebook uh, comments. And then Davy, is there anyone, um, anyone, any questions that uh, that along the way that you want to share? No, uh, no questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I will say if you would like to ask a um, a, a live question, please uh, use the raise your hand feature on Zoom so we know who to unmute and who not to unmute. 
And then Allison just posted the Riverfront Winter at Valade programming. Um, uh, Jamon Jordan, someone's asking about Jamon Jeffries. Jamon Jordan, Black Scroll Networks uh, Network. We can we can put a link to that, Davy. If you could grab a, uh, a link, it's actually so one thing while I'm sharing here. Um, again, we'll share that map with you. But we have um, a whole bunch of resources on our website, including a, a, a link to Jamon. So we have under virtual tour resources. We have resources of all different kinds all the time, um, but. Um, You'll see here, um, there's a bunch of interviews. So with um, people, that's the one part that's missing from the virtual tours, right? Is that normally we take people in to hear from people, you know, and firsthand. Uh, so what we did was actually, uh, I just, was, again, COVID, pivoting, all that stuff. You can go and talk to a lot of today's heroes, today's leaders in the community, uh, hear interviews with them, small business owners, nonprofit, um, folks, uh, you name it here. Uh, so that's on our site. And then also um, there's different tours that you can link that we do, you can link through, but here's Jamam and Black Scroll Network and tours. Um, they have, again, uh, amazing content. Uh, and we, I love partnering with on, with, uh, on tours with him. And I love uh, learning from stuff because there's new stuff to learn every day. And, uh, and, and that's working together is the way that we get the word out about as much that we have in, is going out of Detroit. Okay, I saw a hand raised. Um, who was it? Do you see the hand raise? Yes, Debbie uh, Chandler. Ah, so I Debbie. will ask her to unmute. Thank you. Uh, other Debbie says tour was awesome. Uh, awesome tour and info shared. Thank you so much. Love, love Detroit. I'm so glad. Um, Debbie, did uh, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, the question was, how often do you have these uh, virtual tour tours? I actually sure. wrote it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we have public tours that anyone can join um, uh, any uh, few times a month. Currently, we might expand okay. that. You know, um, actually, I'll, I can show that as well here. If you, um, and then we have one specifically that the Riverfront Conservancy is sponsoring another one next month, March 11th. So well, exactly one month from now at 6 p.m. on women in history, Detroit's history. Uh, uh, again, with just the, you gotta have a niche somewhere. So the riverfront obviously is the focus, um, but oh, our public tour schedule is here and we call them practically free. You can uh, donate a dollar, like that's, you know, it can be, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or you know, more is always good too. But um, anyway, so we have um, the Riverfront one, this Saturday, Friday, no, Sunday is Valentine's Day. So we're doing one about buildings we love, but almost lost. So the before and after of all the buildings that we've renovated uh, in the city, really cool. This Detroit in context is really gets into some of that deeper stuff. Um, the assets, okay. the history and the challenges, uh, and then Innovation and Inspiration, Black Art and Artists, uh, Women's History, you can see that one. Um, we have a couple ones during, when, and then our um, Urban Planning, and then the Short History of Racism uh, is uh, at the end of March, because we just did it on Tuesday for February. So, right. but we have custom, you know, you tell us how many people and how much time we can customize stuff. And then we also have, um, this was something new that we're, again, we're figuring it out during COVID, there's some tours that are kind of, uh, that you can just go and listen to whenever. We have some on Detroit music, art and architecture, you know, and this is like, you donate a certain amount. We have the Riverfront Past, Present, Future. These are not live anymore. They were recorded live. And then you can just watch them on, on, on your own uh, whenever you want. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions, comments, a favorite? Um, a big wow moment. What's what are you going to share with other people? What are you going to walk away and go? Do you know what I learned? Did you know this? Did you know that? Yes. Uh, leap, leap for joy has a question. Okay. Yes. Um, how did you say we can access um, the information for the coming tours? The, uh, can uh, you hear me? Yes. Yep. I can hear you. Sorry. I just stopped the sharing um, feature. Um, the upcoming tours yes i've written them down but i don't know oh, how to uh sure we can put um you know i'll just put this link right in here um it's on the detroit experience and i'll put the link here specifically to the um the public tours where you click you know you can see the schedule here oh, and then uh and then okay. you know sign up for any as, as, 
as as you want, as many as you want. It was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, any updates on the development of West Riverfront Park, former Joe Lewis, and Riverside Park? Um, well, oh, sorry, let me actually, so that's a lot of, di there's diff many different things there, um, but really quick, I can share with you, um, doo -doo -doo, let's just see the best way I want to do it real quick. I'm going to pull up um, the, which one am I pulling up? Sorry, bear with me. So uh, Joe Lewis, uh, the Joe Lewis site is likely to be a mixed use development, which is just the word used for almost any development, right? Um, and the, um, which it might, they're talking, I mean, this is all pre-COVID. COVID's gonna really change things, right? Uh, so the, um, they, you know, hotel possibly, some residential, you know, lots of different things. It was actually got, uh, it was part of the bankruptcy deal uh, that uh, instead of giving someone debt, I can't remember the name, is it, was it Sinai? No, I can't remember which one right now, but instead of giving them the money that we owe them, we gave them that land uh, to develop. Uh, so I haven't heard anything super lately, uh, but and when we talk about West Riverfront Park, that, my dear, we have some information for you on. Uh, and this is actually from a different, you know, a tour we do all the time, but this is gonna be, these are just a couple of the renderings of the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Centennial Park, which is uh, currently slated to be completed in 2022. So guys, all the parks along the riverfront are amazing. And again, not saying that because you know, they paid me to do this tour, but uh, I live right by, I live in Lafayette Park. I'm on the riverfront with my two-year-old triplets all the time. Uh, we're so lucky, but this, this park guys is gonna blow them all away. Uh, this is gonna be one of the best new public spaces in North America, if not the world. Uh, and I'm not just saying that, they not only did amazing due diligence with, there's a community um, or a uh, committee so they got, got regular Detroiters out there and said and put the you know got, got their feedback and then took them to other cities and showed them other uh what other cities have done and then you know got more community feedback and and more community feedback and then they did a contest for designers you know around the world uh and so this is what they came up with um and so the coolest part I think for me uh, I think for a lot of people is that they're going to actually build this cove so that there's going to be a beach on the Detroit Riverfront. So we know that there's a beach on Belle Isle right now, which is great, but you might not realize that you really, it's difficult to have a beach on the river because it has a really strong current. So you can't just throw a beach, you know, at Hart Plaza or something. You have to build a cove or like uh, Belle Isle has a natural cove that, you know, where, where it makes it safe. Um, and so that is gonna be a game changer. Uh, and then also, uh, I'll put this link here. Uh, you can f in the chat as well. And it's on the Riverfront site, of course, but you can click through to just the all the different amenities okay. that they are gonna have um, in uh, here uh, throughout, there we go, um, you know, in West Riverfront Park or what is today West Riverfront Park that will be again soon. Ralph C. Wilson, look, ice skating, that's great. I'm so, ice skating on the little cove. What a great idea, you guys are so smart. Um, here, I'll put this link here so you can have fun. Um, oh yeah, and so um, someone posted that it's already, that they've, uh, oh, that they've been awarded some uh, prizes before but they are currently looking uh, up for 10 best for, uh, Riverwalk. So uh, vote, vote, vote for the Riverwalk. Davey put a link in here to that. And I just put a link to these renderings uh, and more information here on the Riverfront site uh, so you can see, but it's very, very exciting. Um, Riverside Park is a separate uh, and Riverside Park is uh, under the Ambassador Bridge and it's not part of the currently at least. Um, and I don't know anything that would be make it different. But anyway, Riverside Park uh, is under the Ambassador Bridge. And actually, look at this. If you haven't been down there, they built this really sweet skate park. Um, mm. Now, we can get into the fact of whether they were, you know, doing a deal with the devil a little bit that they had to work with the Maroons to uh, who had 
previously taken over this park. That's a long story. But you can see, look at this uh, development, the city of Detroit. So this is a city of Detroit park. Uh, and one of the interviews I shared uh, on that link here is, uh, or that on our resource page is with Brad Dick, who's the head of general services in charge of the parks. And so he uh, talked about all the, the millions of dollars of investment, both in you know, bigger parks like this, but also little neighborhood parks all around the city, 55 neighborhood, like tiny little parks that only, you know, if you're in that neighborhood, but the neighborhood makes all the difference too, right? Uh, they've invested about 300,000 in 55 of those parks. Uh, but having the skate park over here is a really unique asset. You can see the basketball court. Um, and uh, so that's uh, the three questions you had, Joe Lewis, uh, West Riverfront Park and Riverside Park. Um, Another question, uh, any updates? Okay, we got that. Do you know anything about the tunnel that used to go through from Belle Isle? Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, I don't know anything that much more about it. I mean, um, there obviously, you know, there used to be a tunnel, I mean, that went through uh, to Belle, from through Jefferson to Belle Isle. Um, I haven't really heard much. I mean, obviously I haven't heard much about it lately because it's an older thing, but um, but I don't know too much about it. So I can look that up for you or I'm sure Google. Um, and Davey here is a historian and just got his uh, degree uh, uh, from Wayne State uh, in history. So uh, Davey's gonna jump in on that one. Yeah, it's a, you know, tunnel is a little bit of a misnomer. What it was, was an underpass for West Grand Boulevard, or excuse me, this would be East Grand Boulevard because it's on the east side for East Grand Boulevard to go under Jefferson Avenue, come up onto the Belle Isle Bridge, which is officially named the MacArthur Bridge, so that there was no big intersection between Jefferson and East Grand, which are two, especially before freeways, major thoroughfares for the city. So it really is more of an underpass than a, a tunnel. There was, there was no tunnel like under the Detroit River to the island, but but yeah, that's what most people refer to when they say the tunnel to, to Belle Isle is just an underpass where East Grand goes under Jefferson. Right. It never went under the Detroit River. So in that sense, yeah. Um, like the Detroit, um, like the Detroit Windsor Tunnel. And we do have a train tunnel though that goes under the Detroit River um, closer to the, you know, between the Ambassador Bridge and uh, like about Michigan Central Station, um, uh, actually in in um, in Corktown, uh, we have a question about the potential development of the Uniroyal site. So, uh, for those that aren't familiar, the Uniroyal site is the um, the site adjacent to the Belle Isle Bridge or MacArthur Bridge. Uh, on the other side, there's Gable Richard Park, and then Plaza, and then there's um, the uh, Oh yeah, someone just posted a link to the tunnel question. Um, so actually, let me let me go. Let's go there. That's what's so great about this. We can just go uh, and do that on the map here. Um, so it's called the Uniroyal site because surprise, surprise, Uniroyal Tire. Uh, we actually we were the auto and just you know Motor City, uh, but we also had lots of tire. There was actually a, what was called Tire Row uh, over here. So again, here's Gable Richard Park. Here's the Uniroyal site. And so this is, um, you know, if we go there, you, you might, might be like, oh, have I driven by it? What's there? Because the answer is nothing much uh, for a while, you know, even just going back 10 years. Now, in about 2009, they'd been, they'd been talking about this for a long time and slowly but surely working on it. And by working on it, they needed to do a lot of remediation because not only was Uniroyal there, but Shell gasoline, you know, there was just a lot of pollutants there and the remediation. Oh. Uh, you know, took a long time. It also got uh, slowed it down because uh, back in, I guess that was right about 2009, the um, the historic tax credits and brownfield tax credits were uh, removed uh, by the governor. And so that slowed it down. Uh, but short story, uh, you know, so that's the long story. The short story is uh, we should, you know, the Riverfront Conservancy is doing the, the first, you know, the most important part. And it's a lot of work right now in that they are, um, working on the river, what will be the river walk, right? So you have Mount Elliott Park, and then this is all the Uniroyal site, right? So they are in the process of working on the, uh, making the river walk happen here uh, to connect to uh, Gabriel Park, Gabriel Shard Park. And then you'll be able to go from 
Gable Richard Park all the way to just past uh, what was Joe Lewis. Uh, so in terms of developments for here, there's been a lot, few plans, ideas floated, certainly nothing concrete lately, uh, but again, likely mixed use, right? And that's, I mean, mixed use is, it's an accurate word. It just can mean a lot of different things. It means it's not probably going to be just a ho just a residential or just commercial. Uh, that it'll be pr probably some residential, some commercial, some office, some retail. I mean, uh, again, and COVID puts a lot of unknowns into the uh, picture a little bit, but uh, but there will likely, I would say, in the next you know few years, you're going to see a development. And I'm you know I'm sure there's people with some inside scoop that I don't have. Uh, that's the one thing about COVID. You don't like run into somebody at the bar and get the inside scoop at them, or at least you should not be running into people at the bars um, during COVID because it's, you know, we don't want to, but it, that's where I'd get a lot of my scoops from that uh, I haven't been able to get lately. Also a two-year-old triplets make it a little bit harder to be getting those scoops at the bar too. <laughs> uh, any uh, other questions? Yes. I'm online here. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, from our uh, person, any plan to use the old rail line to the old Uniroyal part of the river walk? Um, come in from Facebook. Um, Can you repeat that again? What, what, what? Any plan to use the old rail line to the old Uniroyal part of the river walk? Um, I'm, uh. a, I'm a rail history buff and I am not even aware of any old railroad lines there, like maybe pre 1940s or something, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, heard any. I don't think, like, as far as I know, that nothing really ran like along the riverfront. You would have had, you know, like the Dequinder Cut, right, was the Grand Trunk Railroad, right, bringing things into the riverfront. And there yeah. is adjacent, uh, maybe you're talking about um, adjacent to, the riverfront here is, uh, or to the Uniroyal site is, um, where is it? It's like, there is another kind of rail uh, way that I think there's some plans to uh, you drive over it, like right around here um, to, to kind of do a little Dequinter cut for that. Like uh, not, you know, never an underground, never a, uh, uh, below grade rail line, the Joe Lewis Greenway um, is another newer addition to the Riverwalk. Again, not exactly answer your question, but um, but we, what we've learned from the DeQuinter Cut is this, in part of this rails to trails program that was happening around the country uh, and uh, and how to you know make it easier, have pedestrian access to the riverfront is to utilize some of, um, of those resources uh, or you know, do e better connections. So if you haven't, also been to, uh, again, say uh, the Joseph Campo Greenway. Where is it going? It's right here. So this is a beautiful greenway now uh, with like, it slows down traffic and then goes through uh, Ralph Bunch here and uh, even up in here. Um, and I've, and that's a nice walk too, but I, but I don't know uh, much about the, uh, I don't know about a railway coming through to the Unimural site. Um, great, great. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, okay, iPad is all we have is your name. Someone raised their hand. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you like. Yes, uh, my name is Tony. I'm sorry I don't have my name on there, uh, okay. but you got the iPad. I can answer the question about the railroads in the area of uh, the Uniroyal plant. There, there wasn't what you would call a rail line, what there was in that whole, what we not sometimes call the warehouse district down there along Atwater, there was a lot of railroad tracks that were laid in the streets. And back as late as the early 50s, the railroad still moved freight in and out of that area, but it wasn't a rail line that could be utilized like we use the Dequinder cut. Because where, where, they, where those railroad tracks were, we're just where the streets are now and they're gone. And, and that was obviously separate from like the streetcar. I mean, yes, we had yes. lots of streetcar lines there too. Yeah, the streetcars were on the main roads like on Jefferson. Streetcars ran on Jefferson. Right. Uh, but so, uh, south of Jefferson, 
there was a lot of rail oh, traffic, but yeah, yeah. nothing, nothing definite, you know. No, Same I, thing I, with the, the thing you're talking about uh, north of Jefferson that comes down, uh, came down to Jefferson. Uh, uh, there's a there's a building there now, Jefferson Lofts. That yeah, was just yeah. that was a surface railroad track that came through there. It wasn't similar to the Dequinder cut. Okay. Yeah, that's and someone mentioned. Um, Bellevue, well, Belvedere, but I think what they mean is Bellevue, because, uh, but I now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you're right. Like, like if you look at, I wonder if it'll show. This is the fun part. Um, let, let's go see if Google Street View. Well, first of all, I'm right, I'm already I'm right over here. So, and Jeanette, while you're doing that, I yeah. just want to remind everyone that at Valade Park, part of their winter programming is having local restaurants come in and provide food. So February 19th to the 21st, which is uh, next weekend, uh, Smokey G's and Geisha Girls are the two restaurants that will be providing food. Uh, Geisha mm. Girls, I know, is sushi. And I, I don't know what Smokey G's is, I'm, but I'm pretty sure you do, Jeanette, because you know everything. <laughs> Smokey G's is the barbecue place. Sorry, I, wasn't, I was just looking at something else, but I think that was a question you asked, right? Yes. Mm, and she knew it. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, so this is what I was just, so the belt line, it was, uh, and thanks to, to uh, Rachel and, uh, and Renee here, but this is what I was talking about along, like, um, they're talking about, you know, you can kind of see this under, again, another almost like overpass right here, or this is an overpass over uh, a little trail here. Uh, and there's a conversation around making this, um, you know, a little like the Dequinder cut as well. Uh, and um, and then what I was gonna see uh, based on I think it was Tony right uh, is there um, you know on Atwater because I do remember now that you know not that long ago it seems before Atwater was paid when you look at the old pictures right and I'm sure I don't think it goes back far enough but uh, but when you would look at some of the old pictures the before pictures of the riverfront. Um, before the conservancy got there, you these were like gravel streets, right? So they likely had just pulled up some of those, you know, or um, those those tracks that again weren't underground, but uh, but there it wasn't a pedestrian area. It was a it was a commercial area, right? I think that's the important thing. The the befores and afters of um, the riverfront. If you haven't really seen them, again, the riverfront.org. I mean, I think it's um, always amazing to um, oh, I did the wrong way, uh, to appreciate something, but I think it, you know, oh, this is a cool thing, but when you know what it came from, and kind of same thing with these stories that we talked about today, right, like, um, that, you know, it, how, it's not just that they took a park that was already there and did some, fixed it up a little, I mean, this was, you know, absolutely, um, com you know, wasteland areas and there's actually Coleman Young uh, I forgot to mention uh, and I was talking about him that it was his um, you know it, it, he started the push he thought hey it'd be really great to have a riverfront uh, you know have at more riverfront access and things like that so um, there's a whole you can see on the riverfront conservancy site they have some really great uh, before and after pictures right so this is down by uh, more the Joe Lewis side here's that a quinder cut right um, and then Gable Richard and just this parking being used in front of the riverfront. And again, just totally non-usable space here um, in so many different ways along the riverfront. So uh, just kudos to them and uh, the team uh, for continuing to just make it better every time. So um, we have just a time for maybe one more question if there's anybody. Um, yeah, and sorry, the Davey just want we just want to be clear that the uh, uh, Geisha Girls and um, Smokey G's Barbecue are uh, permanent uh, restaurants at Valade Park, uh, and they and you can do um, carry out. Obviously, well, it's not carry out, but you you can just drive up and pick some stuff up, or you can uh, eat it at the park uh, and next to one of those fire uh, pits that they have. Uh, and they even have a really cool thing called a sled shed. So you can, uh, and a great little hill for uh, the kids and, uh, and, and sleds provided that you can just, 
you're not even checking it out. You just use it as you can and then put it back when you're done. Uh, and just so much fun. Uh, I took the kids there not that long ago. Uh, and it just a few weeks ago, it was really awesome. So, uh, so don't uh, stop using the riverfront, even uh, though it's cold outside. The, I think it's the Norwegians that say, there's no bad weather, there's just uh, bad clothing. So, all right, Kim, I see a raised hand. You're gonna be our last question uh, of the night. Kim, do you can you go ahead and you can unmute yourself if you like, or Davey can I might stop sharing. Um. Kim, I got gotcha. you. Or you can just type it in the thing if Kim, if you'd rather. Um, or maybe you don't have a question any longer. That's fine. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us uh, today. Uh, and uh, oh, that's great. It's an all, uh, awesome tour I watched with my grandson and he learned a lot. He was amazed. Awesome. That's what we like to hear. Um, Multi-generational fun for the family, which is obviously what the Riverfront is all about as well. Bring everybody uh, is their hashtag uh, and is, is totally true. Everybody's welcome and uh, more and more people, the better, especially as, but wear masks too. <laughs> more people, but wear masks. Uh, okay, one, Sharon raised hand. Okay, one more question from Sharon. Okay, you said that this was a recording. Is there any way we, any way we can access it again? Yeah, so um, great uh, question. So because of the uh, awesome sponsorship of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, uh, there are two ways that you'll be able to do that. One is, uh, it's, it's on their Facebook. So right now it's live. As soon as we, you know, stop, it'll, it'll just be there as a video on the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy Facebook page. But in addition to that, um, we're going to get this uh, downloaded and then uploaded and uh, we can send a, we'll send a link out to the Eventbrite uh, attendees today that are here on Zoom. Uh, or anyone that had uh, signed up on Eventbrite. And then it'll be on the Riverfront Conservancy YouTube page uh, starting this weekend. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, have a great night. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks uh, for being uh, a part of Detroit. Uh,